Greetings, Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Russell Poe. Where'd you meet Russell, you might ask? Well, I went to a an event, what, it was a couple of weeks ago? Uh, yeah, just and, about. Uh, it was called Strong Words. It's a storytelling event, and he was a storyteller. And I thought, ah, I want that guy in here. So anyway, say hi, Russ. Hi, Russ. <laughs> Don't be so literal. I know, exactly. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Glad to have you. Thank so you. what do we want to talk about? You're a school teacher. I am. I'm a school teacher. And you teach what? I teach middle school, which is very interesting. You. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I teach uh, science and I teach English and I actually teach a class called the business of esports and I also coach. So I get to play video games. So that's fun. The business of what? Esports. Esports. Really? Yes. It's actually another English class, but it's talking to kids about what they can do with video games. It's a whole business now. So okay. they're learning that. So why did you get into teaching? I wanted to get into teaching when I was first out of high school. Okay. But uh, a college professor said, you'll never make a living. Don't do it. So I decided to go into something else, journalism, which can't make a living doing that either. So uh, <laughs> I went. You're on a roll. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. So I actually ended up going into real estate appraisal, and I've been doing that for over 20 years. In the early 2000s, there was a, a bubble that burst, yep. and uh, I realized I wasn't making any money. So why not go back and do what I wanted to do in the beginning? And I went back and got my elementary ed degree. How long did it take you to do that? Well, I had already gotten some, so it took me Part two it, years. Two yeah, years? I had gotten, okay. so I, it took me two years to finish that. Okay. And what year was that when you started teaching? I've been teaching now for 12 years. So wow. 2010, I guess, is when we're 2000, right okay. around there okay. is when I finished it up. So you've been with middle schoolers the whole time? I have. I decided I went elementary to ninth grade is what the degree is actually in. So I can teach anywhere from there. But I thought my mentality is probably a 13-year-old, so I think I'll stay with that. So Wow. Have you had any regrets? <laughs> I've had some challenging days, but I wouldn't say I regret it. I, oh. I'm very pleased with what I have. And there's not a lot of men in teaching elementary to middle school as it is. And I've, I've taught in the demographic that I'm in now, which is very high minority, very low income, and they respond well to the male presence, I believe. So I, I, I feel like I'm doing where I'm, I'm, I'm at where I'm supposed to be. Let's say that. Are a lot of those, your students, are they single parent situations or what? I would say probably at least it's over 30 to 40 percent that's uh and that's a huge that's a huge factor in how how they react and how they act and how they just are raised and and right so what are some of the challenges you've had well along that line students want to get off for a lot of things they want when i say get off they they don't want to take responsibility that is something that i've had a huge challenge with is students saying that they're, um, it's not my fault. It's, I didn't do this. Right. And, or they say, you're, you're doing too much. That's a big thing. You're doing too much, Mr. Poe, uh, meaning that I'm requiring them to do too much work. So you're making them do too much. That's what they <laughs> when say. They say well, that's, that's really what, they, what they mean. Yeah. Reading levels. And that's across the board. That's not just in my demographic, that's students in general. Um, huge challenges in getting kids to read attention span. Again, that's across the board. That is not, that's my children. That's the children I teach. Any kids right. that I would say probably, I, my experience, kids that are 20, mid 20s to early childhood now, they're having problems with um, their attention span. Because it's a TikTok world, that's why. That's exactly <laughs> what I believe anyway. Yeah. So yeah. it is. Everything's everything's just uh, doled it's, out to them in yeah. seconds. Sound bites. Everything's yes. sound bites. Yes. So you don't teach in sound bites? I try not to. <laughs> um, I am I read to my students in my English classes now I, I it's it's a, that we call it a warm up or a bell ringer. But I read to them for about ten or fifteen minutes just to get a chapter in a day. 
And some of the kids there, you can tell I've lost them with just, and I'm reading books that are pretty aimed right for their young adult audience. And right. they're just, they can't hold that attention. And wow. it's, it's, it's stressful. It's, it's stressful to them. Plus some of them just can't read at the at seventh grade reading level either. So that's a, that's a struggle too. So is that reading to them just a warm up? Like, would you test them on what you read? We, I have them write something. So I have them give me a summary of what we've heard that day. I have them tell me, did we see any foreshadowing? Who are the characters? What's the right. setting? So it is, it's something that I'm trying to get them to pull things out of it as they're doing that. So that's, that's something that, that we do. We try to get it that way, but overall, I'm just trying to get them as a middle school teacher. I'm trying to get them to be a better adult. I'm trying to prepare them for what's going to come up to high school or college. Cause some of these kids and I, and I'm going to say this for a lot of kids. I don't believe that everybody has to go to college right now, but they do have to have something to help them. They need to be organized. They need to know we have to be able to get work done on a timeline. Right. We have to be responsible. These are things that, that everybody needs to learn. And it's not necessarily our content, the science or the English. But in middle school, I think that's part of the prep saying, hey, let us get them ready for high school or beyond. Do kids learn math now? They do. They're Cuz I I mean, <laughs> they have calculators and everything else so they can ask Siri and it'll tell you the answer. One of my colleagues has been um teaching, he's a 6th grade teacher and he's teaching math and he's like my kids don't know the multiplication tables. And I go, I don't think my kids know the multiplication tables. And you're right. It's because of calculators. And right. it's because people don't. When I grow, when I was growing up, we would have speed tests. Right. The, you would put a piece of paper in a, and you would just have to do as many problems as you could. And they'd make it a competition. Now, that's too... That's too rigorous. That's your, your, you will embarrass the children. You will do, um, you, you can't do that to them. So that's the way that you memorize is by doing something over and over and over again. That's how you're going to remember right. these multiplication tables. Well, kids don't do that anymore. So just the same thing with cursive. We don't have handwriting in school anymore. So kids haven't, you have to teach kids separately how to sign their name. So they know that they can sign a check or sign. So kids aren't learning cursive. So they only know their own name in cursive. That's it. I mean, if they know that, I mean, that's the generalization. Some that's of them are going to know it. But. Yes. But that's, if they know that some kids don't even know how to do that. Wow. So, and I'm teaching sixth, seventh and eighth grade students. I see middle school students and I know we have one teacher who, has said, hey, here's a packet. They're going to learn this. And so she teaches her kids cursive. So, um, but not every, they, they have stopped doing that. Just like they, you, they don't have spelling in school. You don't learn how to spell. They don't have a, a spelling unit or these are things that when I was growing up, we were taught right. and it was important. It's not so much anymore. What's, what's school is um, focusing on math and English is reading and math. That's and those obviously are very important. But phonics, the sound that that words make, that's not something that is always taught. Spelling, like I said, um, and certain math. It's it's not. They're 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 trying things different ways. But yes, their calculators are a very big thing right now. So, what do you think it'll be like? Well, fifty years, but how about twenty five years from now? I think we do have kids that are, and if you, you can see, we have a good generation of kids. We have kids with good hearts. I have students, there are students there that are pushing very hard. But what I am afraid of is that we are spoon feeding our children and that they are going to, they are going to require that they're going to say, well, give me the answer right. instead of, so I, I think we're still going to have that huge gap of the students or the people that have done all the work and they're going to be up at the higher level. And then we're going to have the worker bees right. that are just like here, I haven't learned how to do these things. Give this to me. And we're moving backwards in that way. That's, that's factory workers. That's not people that we want. We want the 21st century to say here, right. we want people that are going to go out and work in teams and discover things. We have that, but not enough. I'm concerned about that. Well, 
I don't go into fast food places much, but <laughs> sometimes you get the 16 year olds there. And I mean, this has probably happened to you too. So you go in and you're, you know, you're drinking whatever is like $5 yes. and 14 cents. So you give them a 10 and 14 cents. Yes. And what do you get back? You get all a change. <laughs> yes. Plus your 14 cents back. Yes. Cause they can't figure out. The 14 cents covers the 14 of the 514 and give me a five back already. Exactly. It's like, whoa. That I mean, on a practical level, that's probably one of the things that pop out at me. It's like, wow. And you do see that. And that's not everyone, but yes, you're right. That's something that um, you see from students is that they're not getting that. And they rely on the cash register. Right. To do that. Well, yeah, they put the money in and it gives them the exactly. answer. That's but if what you want to do the shortcut, like I just said, forget it. Nope. <laughs> exactly. So that's a, um, it is a worry. I will say that I am concerned. I'm concerned with my own children. I have three children. I have a senior in high school, a sophomore and a seventh grader. And I do worry. I worry that my kids are not pushing themselves to where they need to be. I don't say they all need to go to college. I don't say they all need, but I expect something from them. I expect a passion. I right. expect a drive. I don't see that. Um, and it's not just from my kids. I see, I don't see that from a lot of kids. They don't have that motivation. And Why do you think that is? I, I don't know if it's just, and to be honest, I try to think back and I'm like, did I have that drive when I was a senior in high school? Maybe I didn't. And it's been so long ago that maybe I didn't have that drive and I'm expecting too much. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a gentleman, I was flying in from Chicago and um, he was a younger kid. He was um, late twenties. He goes, I have changed three jobs since I've gotten out of college. Don't worry about your son. He will figure it out. Don't require him to figure it out right now. We shouldn't expect 18 year olds to know what they're going to do. And, that, and that's absolutely true. Well, I think anybody that thinks they're going to be doing the same thing their whole life, I mean, that's, that's just not the world we live in anymore. Exactly. I mean, how many careers do most, well, you've had a couple yourself. Come I've on. had a lot. <laughs> I, I told my, when I, when my kids um, hear how many jobs I've had, I've had over 14 jobs. However, I also told them that I started in sixth grade. I was a paper boy. Right. And so, but my son is 18, What's hasn't a had a job. Boy? What's a paper boy? That's exactly <laughs> right. What's a paper boy? So, and when I told them I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and deliver a hundred papers, they're like, what are you talking about? And I go, yeah, that's what I would go do. Then I'd work at McDonald's and I was a Terminex service manager. There's so many things that, that right. I've done. But the kids, my son hasn't had a job yet and he's going to be 18 in February because he had band and he had baseball and there's always something. And so sometimes I feel like I failed. I told them that I said, I feel like I failed because I haven't required you to have a job. I've given you and given you. I got to throw something <clears throat> in here. So it's okay. one of my stories. So I have three sons and I won't mention which one of them this <laughs> happened to. So he's ready to get his first real job, right? Yeah. So he keeps going out on all of these, you know, interviews and stuff, but he's not doing it. So I said, and finally one day I go, well, so like, what's going on? You know? And he goes, you're not going to believe this. And I go, try me. What? <laughs> and he goes, they want me to work 40 hours a week. <laughs> and he was like, I just assumed he'd know that, but he didn't know that. And oh. it was like a total shock to him that real life job is 40 hours a week. Oh, it's, yeah. trust me, it's, it's amazing what children don't know. I ask a majority of my students what their parents do for a living. They have no idea. These they don't are, even know what they these do. These are 12 or 13 year old kids. They might say, my dad's a cook. My dad manages something. So they know generally. Kind of. They yeah. don't know where they work. So I, I'm amazed. I, I, when I was talking to my students about this, I, text my daughter and I'm like, what do you tell people when they ask you what your dad does for a living? And she goes, I tell them you're a school teacher and you're a real estate appraiser. I go, okay. That, so I felt good about that. <laughs> so I was like, all right, so I could, I could do that. But there's, there's a lot of kids that aren't even aware of what their parents do. And so how do we expect them to have a desire 
to do something when they're not even sure where the money's coming from. Did she ask you why you were from. asking her that question? She did. She yeah. asked me, and I said, and I told her, I said, well, I'm asking my students, and they can't tell me what their parents do. So she goes, are you proud of me? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so wow. It's it's interesting. It's you until you work with again. I'm working with. I see 11, 12, 13 year old students every day. The maturity of what they've seen oh, in yeah. this world is not the same as what they can do reading, right. writing. And when you see what they've seen, some of these kids, your your heart breaks for that, right. for what they've seen and what they've already become and their minds aren't ready for it. They're, they're, right. they're not ready for it. They're this. not equipped. That was my next question. Okay. Is I was going to ask you, have any of them broken your heart? I have had, um, student teaching was the first um, time, this was back in uh, Illinois, where uh, I'm from, uh, the Chicago suburbs. Uh-huh. I had a student, I was getting on him. This one I was going to be, I was uh, going to be that tough teacher where I'm like, you know what? Everybody should be able to pick themselves up. You know, I was a Republican. I'm like, you're going to, everybody can do it. Doesn't matter where you come from. I did it. You can do it. Right. I was getting on a, a student and I was like, you haven't done your homework in two weeks. Why haven't you done your homework? He's like, Mr. Poe, I can't do my homework. And I'm like, you can't do your homework or you won't do your homework. And he's like, my mom puts my brother and I out in the hallway of our apartment when her boyfriend comes over. We stay out there until he leaves. They have spent the night in the hallway. Wow. And he goes, when I get in, I help my younger brother do my homework. I don't have time to do my homework. Right. What do you say to that? I made a call to DCFS, you know, and said, hey, someone needs to pay a visit to this family. Um, it's dangerous. I mean, you can't have can't that. Put a kid out in the hall. No. Yeah. And it does, and and that's not the only time I've seen something like that. Unfortunately, I've had students that have graduated eighth grade, and in between eighth grade and freshman year, they're pregnant. I've had students that were involved in shootings uh, that were in eighth grade, or wow. maybe um, uh, I had a student that stabbed his grandmother twenty times with scissors. There's been so many different things that now sometimes this has happened a year after they've graduated. Maybe they've done it in high school. I've also I've seen kids. Some one of the strongest kids I've ever seen passed away his freshman year in high school from cancer. But he battled for the three years that he was a, at the school in Carpentersville, Illinois. And you see strength out of some of these kids too that you just don't realize they have. And that is what just if you that's what keeps you going is that you see these kids and then you get the letter saying, Mr. Poe, thank you for uh, taking the time to help me out with this. Thank you for um, listening to us and letting us write um, a story instead of taking a test. Thank you for letting us draw a picture and try to give you our information through that. Just thanks for being there. Mm. And that that's why I do it. That's why I love teaching and I can't see myself doing anything else. So it's, it's enjoyable. And I love my students. I tell them every year, I'm like, geez, I love you guys so much, you know? And one of the things that I spoke about in the story, being a teacher is like, when you say story, you mean the storytelling the sto event, yes, right? The story Just I, so I people told, know what exactly. You're talking about. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I tell them that being a teacher is like, is being a parent every year where you, you go through that whole microcosm of having a child where you, you meet the child you get to know them, you love them, and then you say goodbye. Right. And you kind of hope they come back and visit and let you know how they're doing every once in a while. Most of them don't. Some of them do. But that's that's part of it. And it's a very, it's touching and it's great. And it's also heartbreaking. Are you happy you were on the journey that you were on? Or do you wish that you had told that professor to buzz off when... Uh... When he told you don't teach. I don't think I would be the teacher I am today if I wouldn't have lived the life I've done right. that, that I have lived. I think I would have been less less patient. I think that uh, um, one of the things I, I've discussed is that I've I've learned and teaching has helped me learn that I, I went into teaching as a very staunch conservative. You're going to do it this way. Tough love. 
and I came out of student teaching and, and my first couple of years of, of, uh, of teaching as more of a liberal saying, hey, these, we have to realize where these kids are coming from. I don't think I would have learned that as a younger man. I don't think I, my mind was as open to, to see those things. Plus, you had your own kids in the meantime. I did. You wouldn't, if you started out before that, it would have been different. It is, absolutely. I think, um, and that doesn't mean that you have to have children to be a great teacher, but I think it helped me be a better teacher. I uh, I definitely, and in fact, um, I take my son with me. We, we don't live in the town that I teach in, but I take my youngest son up and he attends school with me up in... Uh, don't, uh, do they not have district? How, how does that work? It's, they're, they're they're all, the, it's that? all the same district. It's all the same okay. district. I teach here in the Palm Springs School District. Okay. And so we can you can move around. You can okay. move around that. So you can apply. And plus, I asked uh, the two principals, and they're like, well, that's fine. Come right. <laughs> bring them right up with you. So. Well, and you teach in Desert Hot Springs. I do. And what town do you live in? I live in Cathedral City. So I bet you there's not many people in Cathedral City asking to go to Desert Hot Springs. That, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but um, it absolutely, um, the school he was supposed to go to is James Workman and the principal's like, this has never happened. Uh, so no. And um, the gentleman that hired me, he is now at the high school, but he's like, yeah, bring them up. So yeah, so it, it, uh, it, and it's worked out well. My son does better in a smaller environment and there's less kids up at Desert Hot Springs okay. at the school I teach in. Uh, now, do you actually teach him at all or not? I teach him in the the business of esports. Okay. And I actually get to coach him on the esports team. So I'm the coach of the esports team, which is great because I've coached my other my son and my daughter, they both played the baseball and softball respectively. And so I was able to coach them. I've coached for right. 14 years. Well, my youngest son is not the typical athlete. He does not want to play basketball or football. Right. He's a runner and he is uh he's a video gamer and he's very good at it. And so I was offered a chance to coach the team. It was brand new. They said, do you, do you want to do this? And I said, sure. And so I get to coach my youngest son in that. So it actually is uh, a very neat experience. So are you a gamer? I am. And that's uh, something that my friends and I am 54 and I am terrible at most of my games. But when I was living in Chicago, well, one of my best friends moved out to California a long time ago and how we kept in touch is we played games a lot that's we'd put our headsets on and we'd play right and so we still all do that so we play uh i was playing call of duty just earlier this week with uh three or four guys and so we all get together we turn off we put a party on so it's just the four of us and we can hear each other and we'll smack talk each other and we'll play against probably a 10 year old in china that's kicking our butt but we're uh we're having fun. <laughs> so, wow. But That's a whole world I know nothing about. It's, uh, it, it's very interesting, and I get so frustrated with it. But we, we play baseball, and I enjoy that. I was playing with my nephew and my son. We were playing some Nintendo games this weekend. It keeps us all. My nephew's in his 20s, and I said my son is in seventh grade. And so we all got to, we were playing. It was like, right, you know, and it keeps us going. So I enjoy it a lot. And in case my listeners haven't figured this out, of course, they could be wondering <laughs> with all my guests on here, you're kind of a unicorn. I am. <laughs> because I you're am. straight. Because I'm straight. I am. I'm and straight. you're actually married to a lady. <laughs> I am. I am. I have a lot of gay friends and I, um, I didn't realize it. It seems like the term has changed a lot. But um, during Pride Week, I was out at Dick's. And what? I was I was very popular <laughs> at Dick's, which, by the way, I am. Uh, I was like, wow. I go, this is kind of nice. It's like guys are you're kind of like up. a daddy bear. Huh? I exactly. I was my <laughs> my uh, friend's husband goes, bring your cigars. You're gonna they're gonna love you here. And so I'm a I'm a larger guy with a beard, and I um and I was uh, smoking my cigars, and I was enjoying myself, and people were coming up and telling me how nice looking I was, and I was like, this doesn't happen in real life. Huh. So I was. Uh, what I really liked, especially about Dick's, is that it seems like it was so accepting there. 
And a lot of times you don't feel like that's how it's, you have to be. I mean, I, I know a lot of my gay friends are like, we have to be, we have to constantly be taking care of ourselves and being, you know, like in shape and, uh, and, and it's like that. And with the straight world too, I mean, people, you have young girls hurting themselves because they don't feel, they don't feel right about themselves. And I'll tell you what, going in there. I felt like, you know what? I'm accepted for how I look right now. It's just kind of nice. It was very right. nice. But uh, th- what I was going to finish so with is... So now you're going to become a gay barfly. Uh, no. <laughs> no, but I did enjoy it. And I told uh, I told my wife, I said, we're going to have to come in here. Pride, it was very crowded there. From But from what I understand, it's not always as crowded there. And it's a nice place just to go have a drink. Right. And um, my best friend's husband, he likes to go there and just kind of sit on the patio. And he told me he, he used the word ally. I hadn't heard that before. Um, uh, we were there was a gentleman that was being a little pushy um, and probably had a little bit too much to with drink you? with uh, the whole group. Actually, okay. he was uh, he was just kept saying, hey, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. And it was just a little bit. It wasn't uncomfortable to the fact, but it was just like it was just annoying. Yes. Generic. Yes. Annoying. Yes. That's what it was. <laughs> okay. So and my friend said, hey, these two guys here are allies. They're not gay. They're just here with us, celebrating pride, enjoying the time. And and so he left us alone. And and I hadn't heard the term. And I was like, oh, I kind of like that term, ally. Right. You know, I was like, I, I was just always referred to myself as a friend. Right. You know, but um, ally sounds sounds great too. So, but yeah, I've I moving here totally different experience than living in the Chicago area and uh, love it. Love Palm Springs. Love this area. Love the desert. Does your wife know your gay friends? She introduced me to most of the gay friends. So my wife, when we first met, (laughs) right. My wife's like, she goes, I never thought I'd get married. 98% of her male friends were gay. So she's like, Oh my gosh, you know, I'm never going to meet anybody. And we ended up meeting. I was working with a young lady at, um, <laughs> this is another one of my jobs, but I was a, I was a service technician for coffee machines and okay. downtown. And so I, she's like, Oh, this guy is great. You got to meet him. She was working with her at her second job as a vet at a veterinary. My wife has always worked at, at veterinary clinics. Okay. So she's like, you got to meet him. So we met up and we uh, started dating and she's like, yeah, most of my, and that's how I met my best friend now. Uh, Todd, I met him through her. That's how I was exposed because I, uh, we had talked earlier, my first experience, um, with the first person that I knew was gay, not that I, you know, I had met gay people before, but I worked with a a guy at McDonald's and he, uh, was just very flamboyant. And so, and he talked about it. He said, this is what I do. This is, so that was pretty much the only gay person I had met. And then I moved up to Chicago and uh, met my uh, well girlfriend, wife, and we went to actually the original Hunters, not the Hunters that's out here, but the gentleman that owned Hunters, his, I guess his niece is the one that runs the one out here now. But um, there's a, we, we spent the time after our wedding, after our reception, we went to a gay bar. So all dressed in our tuxedos and wow. So yeah, so they loved us. It was uh it was an awesome night. So yes, I am uh Does she I, hang out with Todd and his husband? We all do. Yeah. It's so there uh, there are they they're our family. They okay. um we are very much they are very much our part of our family. I they consider our children like their children. They uh, call themselves the Gunkles. The so, Gunkles. Yeah, um, cool. but yeah, I have my my friends are like my brothers, and so cool. that's they are very much part of our family. We all need allies. Yes, I think we do. So, so I always ask a question similar to this at the end. Okay. So, what have you learned in your life? If you're going to give advice to my listeners, what would it be? Okay, and this is something I tell my students too. Is and I think it's. What we all know this is that don't do your job for money. That's the first thing. Find what you're passionate about and do that. And secondly, treat everybody, and this is very generic, but treat everybody how you want to be treated or how you would want your mother treated. And don't don't hate anybody. 
Right. That's it. Don't hate anybody. I get a, very sad at how the world is right now between how polarized we are. Exactly. So be kind. Be kind. Be kind and work hard. Well, Mr. Russell, thank you for coming in. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, this no, was you had a, good a long time. day. Thank you for coming. It's, no, it's great. I don't know what time it is, but it's later in the day when we're doing this. But <laughs> we can all dark. go have some dinner now. Yes, we can. So appreciate so. it. Thanks again. Thank you.